Blow the trumpet in Zion, sound the alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, because the day of the Lord is near. There are powers of darkness that are shaking the nations, the suffering, the woes, the hunger, the pestilences, the famines, and all the groanings of the earth through the earthquakes, the mudslides, and all the floods, and all the things coming, all of the things that Jesus prophesied. All things will pass away, but the word of God will not pass away. This is where we are, beloved. Darkness is permeating, pushing in. The day of the Lord is coming so close. And if it catches us the way we are, we shall not be able to stand. Every man and woman, every Donations is a movement to mobilize the body of Christ to complete the Great Commission in this generation. We are preparing nations for the return of the Lord through prayer, evangelism, and through discipleship. We are tasked to disciple beyond the four walls of the church, bringing social transformation to the nations. We are working beyond denominational, racial, and generational lines. We are working as one. We are working as the body of Christ to win our communities for the kingdom of God and to disciple the nations for the glory of God. The Great Commission is being fulfilled. Our communities are being transformed and the kingdom of God is manifesting. Join the movement to disciple the nations. Answer the call. Go. Fulfill the Great Commission. Hi, John Melinda here. I would like to invite you to the launching of the Go Nations movement. Go Nations is an initiative to mobilize and put and bring together the body of Christ regardless of denomination, ministry, and all kinds of backgrounds, we would like to come together to work together for the finishing of the Great Commission. Now you may ask, isn't that what we have been doing the last 2,000 years? Indeed, the church has been pursuing the Great Commission for the last 2,000 years. But we have majorly done it disjointedly, fragmented, each one in his ministry, in his denomination, in his faith camp. Right now we sense the hour is late. Our Lord Jesus is coming soon. The nations are changing, tides are changing, and we need to move fast to finish the work before the Lord comes back. So this is an initiative, Go Nations, to bring together the body of Christ so that we support one another, resource one another, facilitate one another, and work together to see the Great Commission finished within this generation. If you are a ministry leader, a church leader, a denomination leader, or a leader of faith camp, you are the right person to be there. Let's join together from the 24th of November to the 2nd of December in Netanya, Israel, where we are going to be launching this Go Nations initiative to go all across the nations. And I want to say, for further information, you can go to the website, gonations.org and you'll find all the information you need, all the support you need, and I'm excited to say we are waiting to connect together in November. God bless you. As he mentioned, we've been involved in God's work that has transformed the nation of Uganda from a very, very poor and broken society to what God has brought it to be today. And we've been privileged to participate in what God is doing in many other parts of the world. But um, I want to share with you maybe, as much as I have been privileged to see God working and God touching nations and God touching communities, breaking the powers of darkness and bring about the kingdom of God to be manifest, it all started accidentally, I would say. I did not set out to look for it. And that's what I want to share with you today. Because there are many people here, I believe, who may not even think of yourselves as participating in something dramatic 
that God may be doing in our generation. And I want to say to you, it doesn't take the mighty, it doesn't take the powerful, it takes the willing. And if your heart is willing, there's no limit to what God can do with you. Amen? So I'll start with reading the scriptures, the book of Acts. Acts chapter 17, verse 26 and 27. It says, And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, and he has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, although he is not far from each one of us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, creator of the heavens and the earth, we thank you that you have gathered us this evening to lift up your holy name, to glorify you and magnify you. Lord, our hearts desire to see your kingdom come and to see your will done on earth as it is in heaven. So we pray, Father, minister to us by the power of your word. Bring us revelation, wisdom, and understanding, and give us the grace, O oh God, to go out and bear fruits, fruits that will abide. To you, O oh God, we return glory and honor. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> I'll share with you heart to heart. Don't look at don't look at this as preaching or teaching. I just want to talk to you, okay? Uh oh. <laughs> I come from Uganda. And in Uganda when we are talking to one another, we love encouraging one another. So as someone talks, they say, mm-hmm. Okay. So praise the Lord. I, I would love us to interact. I would love to hear you as you hear me. Amen? Amen. We can do better than that. Amen? Amen. That's better. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I was born in the city of Kampala, but when I started ministry, the Lord led me out into the rural areas of Uganda, especially the area where there was war. The war had been going on for five years, and we lived there for about a year. That's when I got the visitation, supernatural visitation of the Lord. That's when he gave the calling upon my life. It was a very, very difficult area to live in because we encountered human skeletons almost all over. Even the building where we were congregating as a church, one room we had to collect all the human skulls. Another room we had to collect all the rest of the bones of people that had been killed during the war. And this, the countryside was very much like that. And as you may tell, a land that is filled with so much death is also filled with so much evil spirits and all kinds of powers of darkness. So it was in that period the Lord began to teach us a lot about the spiritual realm, spiritual warfare, and how to break the yoke of darkness to bring forth his kingdom. A few years later, I felt the Lord lead me to come back to Kampala. And we came back and we planted a church in the city center. And everything was moving very fine until at some point, something very small happened in our team. We had a, a, a ministry team of about 15 people. And it just started burning like a bushfire. It brought discouragement, uh, misunderstanding, misrepresentation. At first, I thought it was a small thing. But the more we tried to solve it, the worse it got. And then it was affecting the rest of the congregation. And it was bringing very, very deep misunderstandings then suddenly it dawned upon me, this is not just a human misunderstanding. This is a spiritual attack that is coming upon, upon us. And that it also dawned upon me that we are on the verge of splitting. We are on the verge of falling apart. And that's one thing I really, really dreaded. I did not want us to bring any reproach to the name of the Lord. 
by splitting and then creating all kinds of animosity and hatred and bitterness. So I was really concerned and I was willing to do anything to save the work. So I went before the Lord and I said, God, whatever it takes to save this work, I'll do it. Just lead me to the right thing to do. And I felt very, very strongly the Lord wanted me to go into a fast, a fast of 30 days. And so I came back to the church and announced that I was going to start a fast for 30 days on liquids only. And I just asked people who wanted to join with me just to join me and walk the journey with me. At first I thought I would be coming and I would be teaching on fasting so that those people who are joining the fast can really walk with me. But the Lord spoke to me on the very first night and said, do not teach and do not speak until I'm through with you. And I thought it's going to be like maybe three, four days and then I can go start teaching. And that's what I announced. I said, give me some three, four days, then I'll start teaching. But uh, the Lord was not through with me until the last day. <laughs> until the end of 30 days. However, he began to show me what the enemy was doing in our midst and how he was uh, confusing our minds and turning us one against the other and how we were misunderstanding each other and taking one another for, to be the enemy. And he showed me the misconceptions, the wrong beliefs, the confusions. There were lots of things, and all of us were at fault, all of us, including myself. So I was very blessed, and I, was, I came to repentance. I really brought uh, repentance before the Lord. And then he began to show me how to deal with each one of my team members. So by the end of two weeks, everything was so clear, so I, I just knew I, I had the answers I needed to solve this problem. And everything in me wanted to stop the fast and go and put into effect what the Lord had shown me. But I had made a vow for 30 days, and I'd only run for 14 days. So I went before the Lord in prayer, and I asked the Lord, can I break my fast so that I can go and put into effect the things you've shown me and bring this whole thing to an end so that the enemy does not continue having a heyday among the stars. What the Lord answered me, first shocked me. Second, it was not at all connected with what I was asking. <laughs> Third, it completely changed my focus in ministry. <coughs> Remember, my concern was, I must protect this work. I must protect what we have built together so that it does not bring reproach to the name of the Lord. So the Lord asked me, he said, if all you have got eyes for is the ministry that was entrusted to you, I want you to know today, you will never accomplish it. And that confused me. He says, if all you see and if you, all you have got eyes for is the calling and the ministry entrusted to you, I want you to know you will never accomplish it. And I didn't know how to respond. I was com completely confused. And he went on to say, what you see as your calling, what you see as your ministry is a very small fraction of what I'm doing. And if you don't see the big picture, you build in ways you are not supposed to build. You build where you are not supposed to build. And you put up things you're not supposed to. And you force me to uproot them, to break them, and to resist you. Until you see the bigger picture, you will never be able to build right. So I began to pray, okay, Lord, what is the big picture? Show me the big picture. And he asked me, do you know what I'm doing with your nation? I said, no. He said, do you know what I'm doing with the nations of the world? I said, no. He said, if you don't know what I'm doing with the nations, 
how can you participate in the Great Commission? And to me, that did not make sense. Because to me, the Great Commission is about evangelism and discipleship. So what, has got, what, has, what do nations have to do with it? And as I was there in confusion, he says, what does the Great Commission say? And I, without thinking, I repeated the words that Jesus said to the apostles, go ye into all the world and make disciples of every nation. And as I said, nation, I thought, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's about nations. So I stopped there and he said, if you don't know what I'm doing in the nations, how can you make disciples of nations? You don't even know what nations are. You don't even know my plans and purposes for nations. And indeed, I had never heard anybody teach on nations in all my life. I'd never heard anybody bring a theme of God and the nations. And so I prayed and said, Lord, I don't know anything about nations. I don't know what you're doing about nations. Will you teach me? And he said, continue fasting. <laughs> <laughs> Remember my question was, can I break my fast? <laughs> so here now he says, continue fasting. It's no longer about my ministry. It's no longer about, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> it's no longer about the problems. It's no longer about the misunderstandings. Now it's something bigger than myself. The nations and his plans for the nations. And he led me, he said, go back in my word and seek for understanding. So in those two weeks, the grace of the Lord just came upon me. I found myself going back from Genesis, just reading the Bible, as if I was just reading a book. And suddenly, I was amazed at how much nations are central to God's working. From the book of Genesis to the book of Revelations, the nations are God's building block. Everything he does, he does through nations. Everything he promises, he promises it to nations. When people rebelled against God at the Tower of Babel, and God scattered them all over the world, it doesn't say there that he divided them into nations. But if you go to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 32, verse 8, it says, when the Most High divided mankind into their nations, he gave them their boundaries and gave them an inheritance according to the number of the sons of Israel. So it is God who made nations. It is he who divided up people into nations. And here, we just read in the book of Acts, it says, and he has made from one blood every nation of men. So nations are not the handwork of man. Nations are not accidental. Nations are God's own doing. He is the author of nations. And he's the one who determines the exact places where nations shall live. And he's the one who determines here, it says, the pre-appointed times. Now, I may not go very deep in that right now, but God has got pre-appointed times for every nation. When the timing of God comes for any nation, two things are bound to happen. One, there's bound to be a visitation of God, which means grace and mercy beyond what that nation deserves. God extends forgiveness. He extends mercy. He extends grace. And in such moments, God always inspires the people of that nation with a hunger for prayer. That's what it means in Ezekiel 32, uh, in 22, verse 30, where he says, And I looked for a man among them who would repair the breach and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land so that I may not destroy the land. He's, he knows the land deserves destruction, but he comes and says, If I can find a man or a woman who will stand before me on behalf of the land, then I'll have mercy upon the land. That's what he, he wanted when he visited Abraham about Sodom and Gomorrah. He wanted someone to stand in the gap on behalf of Sodom and Gomorrah. 
That's why when Abraham began to intercede, God was patient. And God was willing to listen and go along with Abraham as far as Abraham had faith for the land. So when God's timing comes, he inspires the people of the land to seek after his face. This is what we see here. It says, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, although he's not far from us. Unfortunately, it so happens many, many times that nations do not read the signs of God's visitation. Jesus asked the Jews, you know how to tell when it's going to rain? You know how to tell when it's going to be the drought? How come you don't read the signs of the times? And this happens so many times throughout human history up to today. Jesus himself said to the Jews, Oh, Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem, you did not discern the times of your visitation. Now, the pre-appointed times are times of grace, mercy, and forgiveness. But if the people of the land miss the timing of God, if they do not read the signs, and if they do not turn to the Lord, and if they do not seek after God, then the next thing for the nation is judgment. Now, I know we are living in times when many people don't even want to believe that God is still a God of judgment. But our God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. He's not a seasonal God. He is consistent and is true to himself. That's why we can trust his word written thousands of years ago. Because he does not shift and change. And he is the same God. He promises righteousness, justice, and love. But he's also God of judgment. That's why Jesus could say to the Jews, you've not discerned the times of your visitation. Therefore I say to you, your house is left to you desolate. And you will not see me again until you learn to say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. When did Jesus say that? 2,000 years ago. Has that time come of the vis another visitation for Israel? Not yet. That's why we are now praying a lot for Israel. That that day when Israel will open up again to its Messiah will come. Forty years after Jesus said that Israel was, was, Jerusalem was destroyed, the Jews were scattered worldwide. And for almost 2,000 years, they lived in the nations of the world without a nation called Israel. And then God had prophesied through Ezekiel that time will come when he will begin to draw them from the ends of the earth. That time began in 1948 after the world war. When, Jesus, when Israel was reborn after almost 2,000 years, God caused Israel to be born. And Israel, the Israelites have been coming back from the nations, coming back to the land of Israel. Have they, by and large, opened up to the Messiah? Not yet. But he promised in the book of Ezekiel, he said, I will bring you back to the land from which I banished you, not because of yourselves, but because of my name. He says, I'll not do it because you have turned to me, because you have profaned my name in the nations. I'll just bring you back. Then I'll take the heart of stone out of your bosoms, and I'll give you a heart of flesh. Then you will be ashamed for what you did to my name, and you will turn back to me. You will repent, and I will cleanse you, and I will show that you are my people, and I am your God. Beloved, that day is so close. But I want to emphasize the timing. When we miss God's timing, we cannot turn tomorrow and say, oh, okay, now I'm changing. I now want to go. The Bible says, he's the Lord. When he closes the door, nobody can open it. And when he opens the door, nobody can close it. Do you remember in the book of Numbers, chapter 14, when Moses uh, said to the people of Israel, we have come to the promised land. The land they had been like traveling to all those years, all those days, and seeing God's power from Egypt, and now they had arrived. 
And so he took uh, spies to go look at the land. When they came back, they came back with a bad report. They said the land is good, the land is fertile, the land is rich, but the land has got giants. We cannot take that land. We are like grasshoppers in their eyes. We cannot. Let's find a captain and take us back to Egypt. And God was annoyed. And I said to Moses, how long shall I bear with them? With all that they have shown them, they're still like that, murmuring against me. Tell them to turn back to the wilderness. They will not enter the promised land until those who are younger than 20 years have grown up and the rest have died. And the people of Israel, when they heard it, they said, oh, oh, no, 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 no. Let us now go. Let us go and enter the promised land. But you know, when God closes the door, you can't open it. They missed the timing and they went in self-will to try and enter the promised land and they were badly defeated. They were defeated and they had to run for their lives. Many of them died. And none of them entered the promised land until 40 years later. That means the timing of God. God has determined pre-appointed times for every nation. When a nation misses its timing, it goes through a cycle of time before another period of grace is granted to it. In modern times, you can talk about situations like um, Japan. Japan, after the World War II, was completely open to the gospel. Its faith in Shintoism, in the emperor, and everything had been broken, and they were ready to receive the faith of their victors, of their conquerors. And the American general sent a message back to America and to Europe and said, send me a hundred missionaries. I'll give you Japan, a, a Christian nation. But the church was not ready in the Western world. And they missed the timing. Today, Japan is one of the highest cost evangelistic fields. And very little effect is re realized by the work of the gospel there. The same thing happened with Afghanistan long, long time ago. The, le the ruler there at one time invited Christians to come and they were not ready. And today, Afghanistan is one of those very dark, closed territories. What we are talking here is about nations. Go ye into all the world and make disciples of every nation. When I was reading the scriptures in those two weeks <coughs> to end my fast, I realized God divided up all mankind into nations. And then he rejected the nations. That's what the Bible says. He rejected all nations. Why? Because they no longer knew him. They were worshiping idols. They were committing immorality. They were practicing abominations. So he rejected the nation. The Bible says he treated all nations as though they were not a people. He turned his eyes away. Then he raised up a man called Abraham. And he said to him, I'm going to make you into a nation. And then I'll bless that nation. And whoever blesses it, I'll bless him. Whoever curses it, I'll curse him. Because out of that nation, all the nations of the world shall be blessed. First of all, do you realize, he did not call Abraham as an individual and say, I'm going to do my work through you alone. He did not call him as a ministry. He did not call him as a denomination. He called him as a nation. He said, I'm going to make you into a nation. And how long did it take God to produce a nation out of Abraham? 400 years. And God said, know for sure that your children will be captives in another land. But after 400 years, I'll get them out and bring them back to this land. And you remember, Abraham lived and died. Isaac lived and died. Then Jacob, in the times of the famine, 
when his son Joseph was in Egypt and Joseph said, bring my dad. They, let the entire family come. Joseph was not sure that he should leave the promised land to go to Egypt. And God spoke to him. He said, do not fear to go to Egypt for there I'll make you into a nation. The God we serve is a God of consistency. When he says something, he keeps to it. So, ask yourself a question. Why did he need a nation in order to work redemption for the nations? He could have done a ministry. Like today, everybody is thinking, ministry, my ministry, my ministry. But when he was sending us out, he sent us to nations as a church. Go ye into all the world and make disciples of every nation. And a disciple is not just an idle word. It's turn the nations into servants of God. Turn the nations into disciples of God. So I realized from the very beginning in Genesis, God wanted a nation to work through to bless the nations of the world. And then I realized as I continued reading, every time God spoke, God spoke more to the nation of Israel than to any individual in Israel. We, today we are so fond of prophetic words to individuals. Oh, prophesy to me. What is God saying to me? Go back in the Bible. God speaks more to the nation than to individuals. There are very few prophetic words to individuals in the Bible. Most prophetic words are to a nation. He prophesied to Israel. He spoke to Israel and it was corporate. It referred to them as a people. They could stand and believe it because it was them, theirs corporately. And he spoke to other nations too. He spoke to Egypt. He spoke to Babylon. He spoke to Edom. He spoke to Moab. He spoke to Ethiopia. He spoke to all the nations as people. And then he talks about coming back to judge nations. In the New Testament, chapter, in Matthew chapter 24, 25, it says when Jesus comes back, he will send his angels to the ends of the earth to collect the nations. Now when we talk about this parable of the sheep and the goats, we normally refer it to individuals. I was hungry and you fed me. I was in prison. You came to see me. Go back and read. Those are words Jesus is going to speak to nations. They will gather nations before him. Then he will divide the nations into sheep and goats. Now, many times we don't think about that. We think about individuals because our generation is very individualistic. And when we do that, we miss the dynamics of corporate influence. And that's what God intended from the very beginning. God dealt with the people according to their nations. God prophesies to people according to their nations. God promises grace and mercy and visitation according to their nations. Now, when I was reading this, I thought, oh, that's New Old Testament. In the New Testament, it's about individual faith. It's all about individuals. Then I went into the New Testament, and I was amazed how much the Bible talks about nations in the New Testament. First of all, you read John chapter 4. Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, comes to the well and finds this Samaritan woman and tells her, give me water to drink. And the woman says, how come you ask me for water? Being that you are a Jew, I'm a Samaritan. Do you realize the woman is talking nations? You are of the Jewish nation. I am of the Samaritan nation. We don't work together. We don't cooperate. There was enmity between the two. And she goes on to say, now she turns the simple request for water into a religious argument. You Jews say we should worship in Jerusalem. Our fathers told us we should worship in Samaria. And Jesus said, the time is coming when they will not worship in Jerusalem or Samaria because God is spirit. He's looking for those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. 
And she was still arguing. And Jesus said something profound. Jesus turned the conversation also to nations. And he said to her, you Samaritans, worship what you don't know. We worship what we know. Because salvation is of the Jews. Wow. Jesus himself, the Savior, is saying, you don't even know what you're worshiping. We, the Jews, know. Because salvation is of the Jews. Why? The promise was made to Abraham. The promise of a redeemer, the promise of the seed of Abraham is to the Jews. It's only, that's why the Bible calls the Jews the natural olive tree. We are the wild branches that we are grafted in. It was not ours. It was theirs. It was by covenant, by promise. But God gracefully gave us an in invitation. So it's primarily their salvation. That's why the Bible continues to distinguish between Gentile and Jew. And even on the judgment day, it will be Jew first, then the Gentiles. And everything God is saying is said to the Jew first, then to the Gentiles. So Jesus is talking nations to this woman and is distinguishing salvation is of the Jew. Now, we see something else. Jesus is preaching and is beginning to talk about end times. And his disciples come to him, Matthew chapter 24, and say, tell us, what will be the sign of the end and the sign of your return? And Jesus begins to talk to them, Matthew 24, from verse 1. He tells them there will be wars, there will be famine, there will be pestilences, there will be all these shakings, but do not fear, the end is not yet. Then there will be persecution, you will be given up, you will be hated by all nations, and the love of many will grow cold, and there will be many false Jesuses that will come, many false prophets. Then he says, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world to be a witness to every nation. Then the end shall come. I don't know whether you realize how profound that is. Jesus is saying, the end shall not come until something has happened to all nations. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world to be a witness in every nation. Then the end shall come. Has the end come yet? No. So Jesus is still doing something to the nations. And until it has been fulfilled in every nation, the end shall not come. That doesn't mean we can delay the end. <laughs> That's what most of us would love to do. Okay. If we can only delay it, and, but he will fulfill it in his timing. And it shall not be delayed. So the end coming is relevant to what God is doing in the nations. Then another thing attracted my attention. Jesus Christ goes to the cross. He dies on the cross. And his disciples are devastated. They are scattered. They are afraid. They don't know what to do. They, they thought they had given up everything for him. And he appears to the two who were going to the, to, on the road to Emmaus. And he reveals who he is. And they return to Jerusalem to tell the others, we have seen the master. And as they were still talking to them, Jesus Christ appears to them. You can find this in Luke chapter 24. He rebukes them for their unbelief. He tells them to give him some food to eat so he can prove he's not a ghost. Then in verse 44, <laughs> in verse 44, he says some very profound words. He says, this is what I was trying to tell you all the time I was with you. That everything written about me from Moses to the prophets to the Psalms had to be fulfilled. That the Christ had to come and die and after three days be risen again. Then repentance 
and forgiveness had to be preached to every nation in his name, starting from Jerusalem. Now, I want to help you to understand this because you could easily miss the significance. Jesus is saying, everything you read in Moses, now what is Moses? Moses is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, all those five books, that is Moses. Prophets, all the books of the prophets, minor and great, then Psalms. So basically saying the entire Old Testament, everything you read in the entire Old Testament was about the Christ. And what was it saying? That Christ, the Messiah, would come. He would die on the cross, which means atonement, paying the debt of the nations, paying to take away the reason for separation between God and the nations, making reconciliation. And after he rises again, then repentance and forgiveness should be preached to every nation in his name, beginning in Jerusalem. Now, what does that mean? I know we can think, oh, if that's evangelism. Yes, it's evangelism, but it's more than evangelism. Because the way we do evangelism in our modern times is we talk to the individuals about their personal sin, which is okay. It is part of the way we win people to Christ. But I want to say to you, when you bring 1,000 people to the Lord by personal evangelism, all you are dealing with is their personal sin. What they know they have committed, they will repent of, and they'll come to the Lord. But there's something you're not touching. You are not touching the corporate sin of those people. You're not touching the sins in their culture. You're not touching the sins in their history. You're not touching the sins in their worldview. And the Bible says in the book of Exodus chapter 34, God says, I am the Lord who remembers mercy to a thousand generations. But I'm the Lord who does not leave the guilty to go free. But I'll visit their guilt on the, father, the fathers, on the children, and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. We are living in a time when so much is happening in the nations that we do not understand, that we cannot explain. That we wonder, why does God allow this to happen? Some of it is suffering beyond explanation. Some of it is, oh, nations seem to be okay. They are not in suffering. They are not in war. But they are losing out their Christian heritage. And they are being swept along. Children are growing up in an environment where there is no difference between right and wrong, between holy and unholy. But that's what the Bible says, they were sold for nothing. And they grow up without any feeling of conviction. But it's not because of their personal choice. It's because of the society they live in. Why? Because there are sins that are corporate to the society that are not being dealt with. The church is called the salt of the earth. The salt is supposed to Stop the society from rotting. When the church loses its saltness, what use is it? The church in many countries today that were traditionally Christian countries has lost its saltness. It has no more power to stop the nation from decaying, from rotting. And we are watching as these societies are rotting and Daily, they are making laws that are calling abominations acceptable, that are continuously telling their people it's not acceptable to hold up the standards of the gospel, to hold up the standards of righteousness. They make it look like it's outdated to have morals that are godly. And we are looking at this and we don't know how to deal with it. Because the church today has by and large missed what it means to minister to a nation. We know how to minister to individuals. 
But when it comes to ministering to nations, a large majority of the body of Christ does not know what that really means. And that renders us powerless. When we look at the kingdom of darkness and how it operates, it operates with the principles of dynamic, the dynamic principles of a nation. Because a nation has got dynamism inside of it to influence one another. That's one of the most important things about nations. When something happens to a nation, every member of that nation feels concerned. Did you hear about Malaysia? Last year, there was threat against the Chinese people. And there was talk. We were there, and the people were telling us, many people of the Chinese origin said, please pray for us. There's this talk of bloodshed, and it is being stirred up even by people in authority. And what did China do? It says, if you mistreat the Chinese people, we are not going to stand by and simply watch. Now, these Chinese people are not citizens of China. They are citizens of Malaysia. But China is saying, hey, they are our people. They are Chinese people. We're not going to stand by and watch. Now, that is what happens with nations. There's something in a nation that makes people feel we are one. Not because we learned or we went to school together. Not because we enjoy the same economy. Not because we do anything together. But of God-given qualities. What is a nation before God? A nation is a people group with common identities and common destiny. I will repeat that. What is a nation before God? In political science, a nation is a country under one jurisdiction, under one government, under one economy. But in the Bible, a nation is a people group with common identity and common destiny. Now let me first talk about identity. The word nations appears for the first time in the scriptures in the book of Genesis chapter 10. That's the first time the Bible uses the word nations. And it uses them to refer to the descendants of Noah after the floods. Noah had three sons, Shem, Japheth, and Ham. And each of them went out there and had descendants. And each of their descendants had descendants and each of them became a nation. If you read Genesis chapter 10, and you'll find this verse 5, verse 20, verse 30. They are summaries of what a nation is. And then verse 32 says, out of these, all the nations of the world spread out after the flood. So that's the very origin. The Bible is identifying to us the first, ori the first mention of the word nations and the origin of nations, all the nations of the world. Verse 32 says, all the nations spread out across the world after the floods. So, what are the identities? There are many identities. If you really go into a deep study of what nations are, you could come up with as many as 20 identities that you could use to identify a nation. But the three most important that are respected throughout the Bible are mentioned in that chapter, chapter 10. The first one is language. A people of the same language are a nation before God. And something will always draw them together. I always tell people, if you're traveling in an airport and you're in another country which is not your own, you don't expect anybody to know you there, and you're walking, maybe you're a bit late, the plane, you are trying to hurry to your flight, and as you are walking, you hear somebody speak your language. <laughs> I tell you, you are going to pause and say, did you hear that? <laughs> Especially if you are in a country where the, you don't expect your language to be spoken. If you are in Uganda and then you hear your language there, you are going to stop and you are going to look around. Who is that speaking that language? Something inside of you is drawn to that. That is not of human making. It is of God. Second is 
blood relationship. The Bible calls it families, clans. It is all about ethnicity, ethnic group. Again, there is something about ethnicity. You don't, it's not in the mind, it's in the heart. And again, I say this very often. You go, if, you are, if you're moving in this part of the world, you will not notice it. But you come to Africa, where 90% of the faces you see are African faces. <laughs> and then you see one face from your ethnic group. You don't know that person, but you'll find yourself wanting to say hi. <laughs> and that is all. You may not say anything more, but even as you are passing them, you are looking at them and say, hi. <laughs> it's not, you are no conversation, nothing, but something is saying, I recognize you. And it's not that you're being racist, it's just affinity, that something is being attracted and you feel we are one. Then the third identity is territory. When a people share a territory, they share a sense of belonging. If that territory comes under attack, they are going to feel something rising up to defend their territory. Whether they are of the same ethnicity, language, or anything, but if they call that territory home, they are going to share a sense of belonging in that territory. Amen? So, why does God, what is God's interest in nations? Because Genesis chapter 4, God comes down and speaks to Cain and says to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your countenance fallen? If you do right, won't you be accepted? But if you don't do right, sin is crouching by your door. Its desire is you, but you must overcome him. Now, if you really listen to those words, those are words of a loving father. He's speaking to his son and saying, I'm not mad with you. I'm not rejecting you. If you do right, won't you be accepted? In other words, you, have, you are two. You gave sacrifices to me. Your brother gave a worthy sacrifice. You was, was not worthy. But if you do what is right, won't you be accepted? But if you don't do what is right, there are consequences. That's the heart of a loving father. But Cain did not hear the love. He did not hear reason. And the next thing he did was to go and kill his brother. That's typical of all mankind. God speaks love. God speaks mercy and grace, and we don't hear. How many times do you see in the Bible, God says, how long have I called you? And I've stretched out my hand, my arms wanting to hold you like a hen holds its cheeks, but you did not come to me. When I called you, you did not turn to me. Now, when God speaks language, we understand, but we choose not to listen. God chooses to use another kind of language. And that language is a language of circumstances. He brings circumstances to us. And he doesn't have to touch the whole society. He can just touch a portion of that society and the entire society will respond. If you want to see that, you can read it in the book of Psalms 107, the whole chapter. 107. It's a story again and again and again of God doing that to bring people to repentance, to bring people to seek him, to bring people to call upon him. So that is one thing that we have read in Acts. He made them into nations that they may seek him. He can bring circumstances. You remember in the book of Second Chronicles chapter 7 from verse 10 he says, if I close the heavens that there is no rain, or I bring pestilences upon the land, or I bring locusts to devour the land, if my people who are called by my, my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and forsake their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and I'll forgive their sins and I'll heal their land. So God is saying, I can bring situations upon the land 
Today, the, the most important things we respond to are economic crises. And if you go to the Bible, God uses economic crises to wake up a nation. God can use economic crises. He can use famine. He can use war. He can use all kinds of crises. But when the crisis comes, the nation has got two op options. One option is to humble itself and pray and seek the Lord and forsake our wicked ways. Then God will hear and forgive and heal the land. The other option is to become obstinate, stubborn. Then we turn away from God. And you see that in the book of Revelations, where the people are suffering, but they curse God. They are suffering, but they blaspheme God. And God allows even more things to come upon them. Then they shout and curse some more. And God allows more to come to them until they are destroyed. This is happening across the world today. Do you know why the church in many different parts of the world is becoming irrelevant? Because it is no longer capable to deal with the crises that are going on around the world. It doesn't have an explanation. And that is because we miss God's dynamic dealing with nations. If we go back and start studying God's dealing with nations, we will come by answers to what is happening in the nations today. We will be able to stand and say to the nations, this is the way to go. And the nations will see hope. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I want to tie this together. I was in my fasting, and God was op uh, opening my mind to all of this. It was pouring upon me. It was like day and night, my mind was super active. I was seeing all this in the scriptures I had never seen before. And I was wondering, how did I miss all of this? It's all over the Bible. How come I read the Bible so many times and I'd never seen this before? Then I was wondering, what am I going to do with this? It, it was not connected at all with my ministry and the reason I'd come into fasting. Then, towards the end of my fast, the Lord began to talk to me about Uganda. And he showed me the foundations of Uganda. Uganda is a coming together of 15 different ethnic groups that agreed to work together to form one country. And then he was showing me the negative roots and the sins of the, each of those ethnic groups. And says, now they came together to form the sins of Uganda. And was showing me how they affect the nation, socially, financially, and culturally, and, all, and how they form the, the character of our nation. Then the Lord, oh, I, I talked to you about what nations are. Nations are people groups with a common identity and a common destiny. I'll briefly mention about destiny. The Lord was teaching me that if for every nation that exists on earth, there is a destiny. God's destiny for every nation is God's calling upon those people collectively. God's redemptive purpose for that nation. Just as you read in the Bible, Israel had a calling before God. Israel had a redemptive purpose. All the people of Israel, with their individual callings, with their tribe, tribes under different anointings, but collectively as a nation, they had a calling among the nations of the world. So God could use Israel as a blessing to the nations. And that's exactly what he wants when he talks about discipling nations. Every nation on earth has got a calling in God. And when we disciple a person, that person becomes fruitful. John chapter 15, Jesus says, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you'll ask whatever you want and it shall be given to you. This is pleasing to my Father who wants you to be fruitful, showing yourselves to be my disciples. So to make a nation a disciple of Christ, it must be fruitful for the kingdom. It must be fruitful for the kingdom. And for that to happen, we need to know how to break the yokes of darkness over the entire society and bring that society to serve the Lord. Now, you may ask me, Pastor John, does this exist in the Bible? And I will say to you, yes. 
The Bible is full of stories of personal salvation. But I want you to go back and read Acts chapter 19 and chapter 20. It's a beautiful story of national or social transformation whereby the society was impacted by the gospel and transformed. The Bible talks about Paul going to Asia Minor. I think it's been there about two or three years. And the Bible says he preached the gospel until the gospel prospered throughout the whole region. And Asia Minor was transformed. And then it goes on to say it was not just personal salvation, people coming to church. It affected their families. Families changed. You see a family with a diviner that was changed. Then you see many, many families with witchcraft and divination. They brought out their witchcraft, their art crafts, their books, and they burnt everything. So the families were changed, the culture was changing, social norms were changing. Then we see the economy. The business people came together, had a meeting and said, you see, we are famous for the queen of heaven. All the world knows that Ephesus belongs to the queen of heaven. And you know how much money we get, how much wealth. But now everybody is turning away. This man, Paul, is turning everybody away from the queen of heavens, saying she is not God. And everybody is turning to Jesus. We are losing our power and our wealth. So the economic structures of Ephesus were being shaken. They were being transformed. And the business leaders testified to it. They were losing power. People were turning away from the principality that was ruling in the area, which was Artemis, Diana, the queen of heavens. And there was a riot. And there was a riot throughout the whole area, and the government came in. Under normal circumstances, governments in that time were always against the church. If there's any conflict, they would victimize the church. That was not the situation in Ephesus. The governor said, if you have any case against Paul or his followers, take it to court. But I'm not going to allow this to happen. So the government took a stand for the kingdom of God. And if you go back in what, what is transformation or what is transforming revival, it is the gospel coming in not only to change human souls, but it changes the families, it changes the economy, it changes the government, it changes the social values, and it brings, let thy kingdom come, and let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is something that by and large we have missed as the church of Christ in the nations. We look at the big congregations and we are happy. We look at how many people we have, how much money we have, and how solvent we are. And we don't look at what impact are we having on the nation. What is the impact we are having on the nation? He taught us how to pray. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're not just supposed to go get a few people and turn them to the Lord, then let society rot. We are the light of the world. We are the salt of the earth. Our presence in a land should convert that land and save it and redeem it and bring it into reconciliation with God. The Bible says we are now Christ ambassadors, as though the Father was appealing to the world through us, reconciled to God. Beloved, what the Lord was telling me about my nation is, your nation, the visitation of the kingdom of God to your nation is due. The pre-appointed time is due, but your nation is not ready. If you miss the timing, you are going to go into a cycle of judgmental suffering until another op opening comes many decades from now. So he said, arise and wake up your nation. Call your nation to come seek my face. Call your nation to deal with the corporate sins of the land. Call your nation to seize this opportunity of grace and mercy that is coming your way. And he began to talk about the calling he has for our nation. How he wants to use men and women and children out of our land 
to go bless the nation, to make Uganda a blessing among the nations. Now, I'll tell you something. At that time, when all of this was happening to me, Uganda had just come out of war, and by that time, it was not trendy for Ugandan to go out abroad and say, I'm from Uganda. <laughs> People were ashamed of being Ugandans because every bad thing was about Uganda. We were the land of Idi Amin. We were the land of AIDS. We had the highest AIDS figures in the whole world. Our prevalence levels were 36% which means every day for every 100 people who engage in a sexual act, 36 would contract AIDS every day. Then we had war. Then we had abuse of all kinds. So many Ugandans would say, I'm from Kenya. I'm from <laughs> <laughs> they were ashamed of their country. And the Lord spoke to me and said, I'm going to turn that round. I'm going to take away the reproach. I'm going to take away the shame. And it says, even this yoke of AIDS, which you think is impossible, I want to promise you I'm going to take this away. And it says, the time will come when people from all over the world will come to your nation and ask, how did you deal with AIDS? Beloved, long story short, what was 36% prevalence levels it within a period of 10 years, completely changed and came down to 6% prevalence levels. Amen. Glory to God. <laughs> Uganda was the first country in the world to have such reduction figures. America today is promoting a fight against HIV and AIDS, and every strategy America is using, it came from Uganda. They came and did a study, how did you deal with it? Even the ABC strategy and everything, they got it from Uganda. And lots of things God promised. I said, I'll take this away, I'll take this away, and I'll bring this to you. He has been faithful. He has been faithful and he has done it. To the point that people have come in from America, from Britain, from Switzerland, to come to Uganda to document what God has done. There are transformation videos by, I mean, even one of them was by BBC. They came and they were tracing what, they, what has happened in the land. Even CNN, they were tracing the role of faith in the transformation of the nation. And I want to say to you, beloved, this is the call of the Lord. I'll finish with this scripture. Joel chapter 3, verse Verse 9 to verse 14. Joel chapter 3, verse 9 to verse 14. 